What is up everybody? In today's video, we're going to take a look at three design patterns that I think every single one of you should be familiar with. I just launched 23 design pattern courses on Dome Train, and as part of that process, I was thinking to myself, there are some design patterns that are very powerful and some developers just aren't familiar with. So in today's video, we're gonna take a look at the top three design patterns that I think are extremely powerful really practical and useful in specific situations and can have a profound impact on the actual system and software that you're going to build if applied in those situations. Let's start with the very first design pattern, which is the command pattern. The command pattern says, take the various actions that you can do in your system. So if we're talking about a text editor, this can be, let's say, insert text, delete text. The command pattern says, what you should do is encapsulate each one of these actions in its own object. So this won't be the delete text method. This will be the delete text command. And this itself will be a class. Now I just built a system that's built completely from scratch following the command design pattern, which is actually the software that I'm now using to draw on the screen. And as you can see, we have here under redo, etc., various functionality that once your system is designed as various commands, it's much easier to implement the undo redo mechanism. Also, every single thing that you do in this application is modeled as a command. So for example, changing the color to red or to purple or to green, each one of these is a command. And what this allows you to do is to take the command, take the action that you want to invoke and map it to a specific either button or key binding, for example. So when you click control R, then it changes the color to red, but you can also click the red dot and this also invokes the exact same logic. You have the logic encapsulated in some object and you can invoke it from various places. And what's powerful about this is that what you can do once your system is designed this way, for example, each one of these is an individual command, then you can create macros, which is taking multiple commands and executing them together as a single command. So for example, the feature of a yellow highlighter this is a macro that, as you can see, changes the tool to marker and changes the color to yellow. You can see that there's this recursive nature where we're using over here another macro. So the change tool to marker, this itself is a macro encapsulating multiple commands. And this over here is a macro that's using another macro. As for the class diagram, so how this is actually implemented, then you have the following. You have the client. The client is just the other component that's using the other components. And the client will go ahead and use various commands. Each one of the actions of the system will be its own command. So for example, change color command. This is an actual command that exists in this screen annotation software. You've got all these individual commands that know how to do a specific action on what they do the action? Well, on a component that is referred to as the receiver. The receiver is the component that either has the state that needs to change, the data that needs to be manipulated, or some action to be performed. This will of course depend on what you're implementing. This may be, if you're working with a remote control, this will be the TV. If you're working with a text document and each command is insert text, edit text, etc. This will be the underlying document that you're manipulating. The receiver in the end is the object that either has the data that needs to be manipulated or has the action that needs to be performed. The last component that is still left that we didn't talk about is the invoker. The invoker over here in the class diagram, then there's only one command, but usually this will be many commands or a mapping from a, an action to a command or from a key binding to a command. The invoker is the brains of the operation that stores all the commands in an organized fashion and knows how to invoke the appropriate command on request. It will also many times contain internally a list of the executed commands. So over here, you'll have some queue or whatever of commands that have been invoked. And that way, if you want to perform undo and redo, all you need to do is in the command interface, add the undo and redo methods. Each one of the commands will implement the interface. It will also implement undo and redo, meaning you'll know how to undo the changes that it performed and redo the operations when redo is invoked. And the invoker, because it has the history of all the commands and each command has the undo and redo, all it needs to do when performing undo is just pop the topmost element, call undo, and move the item that it just popped to another stack, which will be the redo stack. And then when you want to perform redo, all you do is just pop the topmost element, call redo, and put it back in the undo stack. Implementing undo and redo properly is very complex. And with this design pattern, it makes things way, way easier. So that's the first design pattern, the command pattern, very powerful. 
You want to use this if your system has sort of these individual actions that can be performed and you need some state where you need to know what actions were performed, let's say to hold a command history or you want to implement undo redo. If your system is fundamentally various actions that can be invoked via one or multiple different actions, for example, using a key binding or some user interface, the same action can be invoked from multiple places and you want to be able to undo that action, then the command pattern is very, very powerful. The second design pattern, which is also very, very powerful and is also one of my favorite design patterns, it is the flyweight design pattern. And what the flyweight design pattern says is the following. Let me just clear the screen and let's imagine that we have the following. This over here, let's say, is our screen. And on the screen, we have various squares. So each one of these is a square that is, needs to be rendered to the screen. Let's say that some of these are yellow and some of these are blue. Each one of the rectangles can be in its own color. And we basically have, in this example, various rectangles where they have some things that are common. So for example, the aspect ratio, we're talking about a perfect square, so all of them are a perfect square, but also all of them have the exact same corner radius. On the other hand, the color, the size, the position, these things are things that change. What the flyweight pattern says is don't model each one of these as its own object. Instead, just model this as a single object. This object will have two parts. It will have the intrinsic state. The intrinsic state is the state that doesn't change between vocations. So in our example, this is the corner radius, the position, and perhaps how it's rendered to the screen. So let's say rendering process. The flyweight pattern says, let's take the intrinsic state and separate it from the extrinsic state. The extrinsic state is the state that will change across invocations. So the color, the size, and the position. The goal in splitting the intrinsic state from the extrinsic state is that the intrinsic state is basically shared across all the various logical instances of the object. So each one of these will have the exact same values. And instead of storing it multiple times in memory, then we're consolidating it into a single object, which is the flyweight object. So this over here is what's referred to as the flyweight. As for how this is actually implemented, then what you have is as follows. You have the concrete flyweight. This is the concrete object that has the intrinsic state. So in the previous example, this was the rectangle, which had in it the corner radius and the aspect ratio. This was the intrinsic data. And the way this works is that there's some action that you want to perform, for example, to render the rectangle to the screen. So we're talking about some operation. In our case, this will be render. And the way this works is that the concrete flyweight will receive in runtime the extrinsic data, and then it has all the context that it needs when it's performing the actual operation. So the client gets hold of an object that has the intrinsic state. This will be the rectangle with already the field of the corner radius, the aspect ratio, et cetera, et cetera. And it will pass to the operation method only the extrinsic data completing all the context and in runtime when performing the operation, then the object has all the data that it needs. The last component that we have here is again the brains of the operation, which is the flyweight factory. The flyweight factory is the one that manages the various flyweights. It contains internally a cache of which flyweights it already created. So in the very first time the client needs a rectangle which is a perfect square and with a specific corner radius, then it will go to the factory and say, can you please give me a perfect square with a specific corner radius? And the flyweight factory will say, okay, no problem. And it will create the concrete flyweight and cache it internally in its map of flyweight to a specific key, which in our case is going to be the aspect ratio and the corner radius. In the second time, because the flyweight factory already has it cached internally, then it will return the exact same flyweight. This way, from the perspective of the client, then it just interacts with this interface that knows how to give it the object that it needs. But behind the scenes, we're reducing the amount of memory that we need because we're creating only once all the intrinsic data. The extrinsic data, the data that changes between occurrences, this is what will be stored in memory multiple times because you have to have it multiple times. But the intrinsic state will be stored only once in one object. So that's the second design pattern, very powerful, not that well known. And this can have a huge impact in the overall memory that your application is using when the application really has a lot of extrinsic 
state that is duplicated and can just be consolidated into one object. The third and the last design pattern that we're going to talk about is the chain of responsibility. The chain of responsibility says the following. Let's imagine that on one side you have component A and on the other side you have component B. What the chain of responsibility says is instead of A working solely with B and B containing in it all the logic and the decisions, etc. Instead, what you should do is you should break this up into smaller components. This will be, let's say, B1. And like B1, then you'll also have B2 and B3 and B4. And the way this will work is that now A will work with B1. And B1 will do one specific check. After it does its specific check, then it'll call B2. So A, you can imagine it's passing it over here, some data. B1 receives the data, so does some processing, whatever, and then passes the data to B2. B2 processes the data and same thing, it calls B3 when it's done. And this continues however many components that you have until finally there's some response and this result is propagated back all the way to component A. Now the crucial part that I still left out is that at any point, each one of the components can break the chain and return a result back to component A without calling B2. Basically what we have is a chain of responsibility where each one of the components has some other responsibility. And overall what we have is a system where we have component A not working only with a component B, but instead component B is divided into B1, B2, B3, etc., etc. The responsibility is split up. A great example for this is let's say you have some fraud detection system. So we can imagine that this entire thing is our fraud detection system and each one of the components is responsible for a different aspect of fraud detection. So component A in our example is some object that has in it some object, let's say the payment object, and this contains in it the sender, the receiver, how much money we want to pass, is it international, etc., etc. All the details are in this payment object. Component A can pass the payment to the very first component and B1 can just do the basic checks, checking that the sender has enough money, the card number is valid, etc. And if everything is okay, then it passes on the payment to B2. Of course, if at this stage something doesn't work, then it will break the chain and return a negative response back to component A. Now, if B1 didn't detect anything, it doesn't mean that the payment should go through. It just means this specific aspect of the payment is okay. What it needs to do now is pass the payment to the next handler. The next handler again has a chance to say yes or no and pass the payment on and on. And the processing of the request is no longer just component B, but it's divided across multiple objects. As for the class diagram, then this is pretty simple. What we have is over here A, over here B1, B2, etc. And component A will call the handle method and pass it the data. This is in compile time, it's working against some abstract class or an interface. But in runtime, this will be the very first link in the chain. In our previous example, this was B1. Now, what's nice is that each one of these handlers contains in it the successor, who's the next link in the chain, which means that concrete handler one will have internally as a field concrete handler two. So all it needs to do once it finished handling the request is call the handle method in concrete handler two, basically passing the data to concrete handler two. This is a fundamental design pattern that you should definitely be familiar with. When appropriate, this is a wonderful design pattern. So that's just a taste of three of the design patterns out of the 23 design patterns in the Gang of Four book, which for each and every one of them, I have a full blown course where we look at the example, we talk about the definition, we build a class diagram, we implement everything in code, we talk about the benefits and the drawbacks of each design pattern. I'm confident that if you're not well familiar with the various design patterns, this will change the way you think about software. To celebrate the launch, then the first 200 that use the promo code patterns20 will receive a 20% discount. So if you enjoyed this video, then definitely check out the link in the description. In any case, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and you learned something new. Don't forget to smash the subscribe button, smash the like button, and I'll see you in the next one.